This is the Real Estate Power Play Podcast, getting you the information that you need to become a successful real estate investor. Hosted by Mark Monroe, Ronnie Walker, Gabe Berdarte, and me, Marty Grizzani. Combined, we've done thousands of real estate transactions. So get ready for real stories and true case studies on finding deals, growing portfolios, and making money. Welcome to the show. Everybody here? Yeah, we're here. We're here. What's up, everybody? All right, guys. Welcome. Welcome. Power play. Let's go, guys. Everybody, I'm Marty Grizzani. I'm your guest host today because we have a real, real special show. There's been so much talk about this show. Everyone's talking. The streets are listening. The streets want to know more. I got with me, of course, as always, two of our uh, finest folks here. Number one, top left of me is Ronnie Walker. Welcome to the show host, typically our host, Ronnie Walker. How you doing, my man? You doing good? I'm doing good, brother. Thanks for being here. And then, of course, we have Mark Monroe, top right of me. Mark, how are you, sir? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much, Marty. How's it right. doing? Good. How about you? How are you doing up in New York? Oh, amazing, guys. We're doing good. I'm Because I'm real excited about today because, you know, this is like one of those things that everybody talks about, you know, yeah, what are lease options, sub two? Really what it is is creative financial, you know, creative deals, right? Everybody's looking for information on this. And then what I'm so excited about is I have two of the guys that I've learned some of this stuff from. You know, I have the godfather of lease options right here, Mark Monroe. And then I have literally the king of sub two with Ronnie Walker. So it's, I'm ecstatic. I know a lot of people watching are going to get a ton of value. So anyway, thank you so much. And uh, let's, let's start this thing off, huh? Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Let's jump right in. All right, let's jump in. I want to start with Mark, you know, <laughs> lease options, Mark, lease options. You explain it so well. Um, could you just give us a quick little, you know, basic, what is a lease option? Kind of go into that a little bit. And then I would love a story, if you don't mind, about maybe your first lease option, maybe your favorite lease option, whatever you think would be a, a good value to add to this. Uh, to this show. <laughs> I have uh, many stories. I've been, lease options been my go-to. I started this, God, I'm going to show my age here, in the late 90s. Um, was my really my first investing strategy doing lease options, you know, lease options, rent to, rent to own. It's really the same thing. Um, you see in some of these groups, oh, lease options and rent to owns are totally different. It's really the same thing. It's a linear contract just worded differently. You can put rent credits or whatever in it. But anyways, um, I love lease options. I started out, um, you know, my background was real estate banking. I got into it in 95, um, you know, had a big mortgage company, blew that up, sold that off. And then I came to Florida and I was just starting out, um, you know, I was taking some time. I didn't really want an employee. So I became a broker just myself and I had an admin and, um, you know, I got into doing, you know, refinancing. I was refinancing, you know, people's homes and that's my background. And then back then, you know, interest rates are on like seven, seven and a half and they're much higher. People wanted to sell their homes, but they couldn't because the houses weren't moving that fast. And uh, they already, they, you know, they bought another property at a contract. So I'd say, okay. This is what I'll do. I'm going to I'll buy your property from you on a lease option, a rent to own. I usually like to do about three years. And um, so I would do that loan and I'll do it like around 85% value. So I make money off that loan refinancing. Oh, by the way, your new property that you're going to be doing, I want to do that loan as well. And then I would go ahead and put a tenant buyer into a lease option property. And I knew um, how lease options work from the real estate banking world. Like back then, the lenders... Once you put somebody into a property back then and they've been establishing payment history on a property for two years, the lenders would actually look at it as like almost a refinance, like they had equitable interest. So it really back then it was so much easier. It's regulations over the years did change some of it along the way, but I love it. Um, and I love doing sandwich lease options. You know, I, I just love it. And it's a good cash flow. It's an easy entry point. Um, well, hold on a second, Mark, because you just said something that it caught my ear and uh, I'm sure some of the other listeners and sandwich lease option. What, what is that exactly? And can you, what was your, I guess, what was a deal that you just did maybe recently that uh, is a sandwich lease that would help my brain? Yeah. Um, 
I did one, uh, God, not too long ago near Orlando. And um, what it was, I was trying to do an owner financing or um, actually this, I was trying to do a sub two on it. Um, but the seller is like, no way I'm not taking, I'm not transferring a deed out of my name over to your name or your entity. So they're like, forget it. So then I pulled out my lease option card. Okay. You can stay ownership of the property, but I want to rent it from you, sublet it, buy it at a cer certain price. And then I want to sublet it and put my tenant buyer in there. So I'll buy it at like, say for example, you know, 200,000, I'll lock it in on a contract of 200,000. My rent is like $1,500 a month with my tenant buyer. I mean, I'm sorry, with my seller. And I love it because um, it's a very easy, cheap entry point. And a lot of times I negotiate it just down to one month's rent to get to take the property and control but it. Why, why would why would the seller do that? Right. So you're trying to buy it. Why if it's such a good option for us? Like, I think a lot of people getting started, they're like, well, why, why would the seller take this? What, what are some of those things for them? It's really because you're giving them pretty much almost top value of today's value. That's kind of one of the main reasons. Um, and it works great. Like, you know, if you're a wholesaler, this you should definitely learn a strategy as a backup option. But what I do is I'll give them close to the value and I'll break it down, you know, what you're going to walk away with, you know, with a realtor, all the, you know, negotiating, say that 200,000, I buy it for like 195 or, or 190, right? Then I'm turning around selling it on future value and I may sell that, for, I'll sell it for like 230. So I'm making like a 35, $40,000 spread on it. So, so are you taking, end. yeah, so you're taking what they're doing and buying at full price today and the end buyer is actually buying on what they would buy it at in like maybe an appreciation of what we're anticipating appreciation to be. So you're able to build a spread on selling it above what it is today because they're renting. Is that, am I hearing that right? Absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. And then you're also creating... Um, I love lease options because you call it cash today, cash tomorrow, and cash at the end. You know, and I, I can kind of get into it. So you're getting cash because, you know, I'm getting into this property with one month's rent down, right? Okay. And that, say that rent's $1,500. i am looking for my buyer to do first month, last month security, plus 35 to 5% down. So I may be getting almost $10,000 from my ten, tenant buyer. Meanwhile, I only get $1,500 to my seller. So I'm making that spread up front. Then... I'm also trying to get it like a, you know, two, $250, $300 monthly spread on that too. So whatever the market rent is, say that market rent is like $1,600, but I'm getting it for $1,500. So I'm a little bit, I'll sell it a little bit more market value because this is somebody that's going to end up owning their home. And, and the reason why I like to do two, or actually I like to do three years, lease option, and some of these people will do one year. And it's like the, the people that you're putting in that property, they make good money. And that's something I make sure I, that you underwrite, make sure they can qualify. They usually have, um, they have some credit challenges and it usually takes about 15 months to 24 months for them to get the credit and lined up. And at that time, it's easier for them to own the property. Plus they take care of the property, no issues. You know, it's a whole different they're, type of tenant. Yeah, there are more owners. I mean, Marty, cash up front, cash in the middle, cash at the end. I mean, we're just like rain and money, right? I mean- I love it. We need to we need to plant some more trees, bro. Some I know. I love trees. it. What what I really love about it is this. It's it's for investors who want to have more tools in their tool belt, right? So, you know, when I started, and I think I I don't know if I'm talking for Ronnie and Mark here, but sometimes you look at everything one way, right? We're a hammer trying to just does it work as a wholesale? Does it work as a wholesale? Well, when you add in lease options. Right. When you add in sub two, when you add some of these more creative ways of taking down a deal, you can then now not have to hand this off. Right. You can try to take it down yourself. I, I love it, Mark. I love it. I, I think, you know, keep going, because one of the things that I love about it is the end buyer is the renter. Right. So. So you are really the one of the most important parts is not just getting a deal, but then finding I'm assuming that rent to, you know, that rent to. Uh, own individual right yes yes absolutely they're the ones that um they're they're easy to find um but you want to make sure that they qualify that's the number one thing you know dob frank act in 2014 did put some regulations in place for lease options because you know some parts of the country you had some of these sleazeball investors 
knowing they had like $20,000 to put down to go into a lease option, knowing they couldn't afford it. And then six months, they evicted them out. So you need to make sure you run them through an RMLO, just like you do on your, you know, the owner financing deals. All right, real That's quick, real quick. RMLO, just what's that again? A residential uh, licensed loan officer. Okay, good to you know. know. I'm going to write that down like for that. myself. Yeah. So uh -huh. you need to make sure you, and you, you know, for me, I want to make sure that they actually can qualify. I want them to own a home. I, I feel I it's a good feeling knowing that you're helping somebody out and they're getting into a home and you're giving them an opportunity. I can't tell you how many times over the years that people have reached out to me and like, hey, you know, I can't thank you enough and I get referrals. Um, because it is, it's a good feeling and you're you're giving them a stepping stone and they don't know how to, you know, they're just stuck in that one place and don't think they can ever have home ownership. Well, you know, and, and with then, today's well, in today's market, I think that that's so critical because a lot what a lot of people don't realize they look at the market, they see how hot it is, and they're like everyone's buying a house, right? But what they don't realize is that literally fifty percent of people who go to apply for a home today, like the standards are tight tightening, especially if you own your own business, if you have a side hustle, if you don't have a W two, like there's there is minimal options, and the cost of those options are so much higher. So you get people who are semi-successful, right? They might be in the top 20% of income in America, maybe not the top 1%, but they get that from multiple areas. So what they qualify for is substantially less than what they make. And that's like 50% of people that oh, I Ronnie, don't and then, realize. Ronnie, and then you add the other 50% of people who made it just had a divorce or their credit's bad. Exactly. You have right. a life scenario that literally disrupts the living standard and they don't know what to do. I think that's great. Uh, Mark, uh, there was a question in the comments um, when we asked from cash offer uh, terms it says, uh, tell us some of the downsides of lease options. Some, some people love them while others dislike them. And I'm, I'm assuming this is coming from the downside for, for the investor, right? If I'm doing lease options and I decide, you know what, I want to add this to my tool belt. You've gone through, I mean, a, a ungodly amount, right? Yeah. So what are, what are the pitfalls? What are the things that Marty, I jump in, we're like, yo, we want to build 30 properties. We want 30 lease options. Like what, what are some of those downsides? I, I would say the downsides, if you're going to do a lease option and if a property needs a lot of work, you know, I do not like, if I have to put more than $10,000 out of pocket and, and you're doing a lease option you, and you don't own, and you're not having ownership of the title, that's dangerous. I, I, I was talking to this one guy and he, he did a lease option and he put $30,000 in improvements. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like you don't own that home. So, you know, and then I told him that you better go ahead and record something, notice of interest. So, you know, because technically I, I've had a situation once back in 2004 where, um, and I learned from it that, you know, at that time the market took off and in two years that property went up $78,000 and the seller didn't want to sell. So that was probably one of my worst scenarios. So, you know, and then I locked in, you know, I sold that thing literally for 230. It was a 200 scenario I gave you. It jumped up to set, it went up $78,000 and the seller was like, I'm trying to get out of this. Um, so we actually just ended up negotiating me as the investor. I ended up pretty much losing on it. I wanted my buyer and my seller just to kind of work it, work it out. Um, so I did lose, you know, 30, 30, $40,000 in that particular deal, but it is what it is. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really lose money, but I did lose money because there's profit, potential profit. That's probably the worst. It's losing money. Trust me, it's losing money. I feel it. It might it not is. be realized, but come on, bro. Like, you lost some money. No right? doubt. Like, it's, it's just what it yeah, is. but Mark, how much money did you make after that mistake? That, there you oh, go. Yeah. Yeah. I. I uh, oh God. I, that was my only mistake. I just made sure that like, I my there's I put in my contract. Uh, I learned something from it. So if, something I can't perform on title, you know, that allows me to get out of my end buyer and I just give them the, their, their option feed money back. You know, that's kind of what, so I don't lose like crazy like that, but I also make sure like my, everything's recorded. And nowadays like everything's documented. I use an attorney a lot of the time, it, you know, everybody's a little different, you know, but, um, but the cash flow, I love it. And, and I highly, highly recommend if you're a, a new investor, and you don't have a lot of capital, lease options are one of the best ways to go because you can control property and not take title and have ownership of it just through contracts.
Who are some of the leads that you're talking to, Mark? Like, like I, I, I'm trying to think of like a seller, you know, when you're talking to them, what is it somebody that has a, like a listing on Zillow that they're renting that they can't rent or what? I mean, what does that look like when you're finding a, someone that you could buy one of these from? Yeah, um, especially if you're new getting into investing, uh, you got Zillow's free leads pretty much. Um, mm -hmm. I had um, the market's a little crazy right now, so it's a little bit tougher. But, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I had one VA just strictly going on Zillow and just pulling for sale by owners and renters and just seeing if they're willing to rent their property for a few years and then they're willing to close on it. Um, you know, if you want to if you don't have money and you have poor credit and you want to buy a property, make sure that you have a minimum of two years to three years on that lease option, you know, or your rent to own, if you will. And when you talk to sellers, you want to use the word rent to own. They, when you say lease option, their head spins. What, what's a lease option? Yeah. So I always use the word, you know, rent to own. They all understand well, that. that. That reminds me too, you know, it's, it's funny. So the house I'm in now, we just bought in January and uh, of this year. And a lot of people are like, well, that stuff didn't work anymore. We found this property on Zillow. You know what I'm saying? Like this house that I'm living in, which is a 4,000 square foot house. Um, like we found this house on Zillow. There's tons of land around us. Um, it's a great area and it was a Zillow lead. So a lot of people are like, well, it doesn't work and the market's here. Like what you're looking for is you're looking for people who are holding out or it's been up for a long time or they're asking too much or they're renting and you're looking for, for criteria that they're not an investor. Right. And I think that's that's what I'm looking for. And even if they are they're they're a mom and pop investor. They're not some institution. Right. It's you get up and it's like there's, you know, 18 photos and they took it with their phone and their their description isn't really well put together. And what I've found is as we start pursuing that, like and we look for those opportunities, those are the ones that that pop up even on the Internet. So I'd recommend you know, kind of what you're saying is feel free to jump in and just look for some clues. Look, look for information that keys in to the fact that this person might want to sell their house. Or this person is, I think what I like to think about, Mark, and, and I think you touched on this really well, is why would someone sell? Why would someone sell their house for this? And the question is, people want to feel like they're maximizing their investment. And so if you can come in and say, hey, let me help you maximize your investment, but lower the risk and make it easier. I think we're all, I'm constantly looking for where's the balance between the most return and the least amount of risk and also the, the easiest to do, right? Because I don't necessarily want to do the hardest thing. I don't necessarily <laughs> want to do that, right? And I think if we all take that idea, we live in America, we live in convenience, right? If we can provide a convenience. I think for me, like take my own weaknesses and be like, yo, I'm pretty sure my own weaknesses, like thousands of people have them too. So let's just bring that out. So I think, Mark, I think you touch on a great point. Just talk to people and show them, hey, this is what I'm willing to do. Are you? And just explore the situation no matter where you get it from. You know, you just uh, said something that um, why, why would somebody want to do this? Um, one of my last ones, oh, I, about a, a couple of years ago, I did one where – you know, the seller, he wanted to do it because the way I do it is like, I'm taking over all the maintenance and repairs up to a certain like $3,000. Really, I pass that on to my tenant buyer, but they loved it because he's like, oh, you know, can we extend it longer than three years? Can we go five years? Because I want that cash flow coming in because his mortgage was low. So he liked it. And he's like, almost like being a landlord, but you don't have to worry about the headaches of being a landlord. You know, and, yeah, and, and we quite, just did one in New York, seven years, same exact thing. The guy wanted to do a seven year lease, which I'm happy. I get cash flow. He gets it like, right. Like, so absolutely. I love that. And that, one, that one's a fat one. That's a, a nice cash flow one you're getting on that one. Nice job. Yeah, it's over one. a grand. Yeah, it's over yeah. a grand. Well, hold on. Awesome. Pump the brakes, Ronnie. What the <laughs> heck? What's this? Give me some, give me the story on this guy. Yeah. So, uh, so we reached out to him uh, through our marketing. He just came in. Uh, we flipped the script from the wholesaling, offered the owner finance lease option, and the guy put $30,000 into his backyard. So not only did he has the house been remodeled, but he redid the backyard to make it basically completely landscaped. He put in a nice pool. There's all kinds of things that are super picturesque. And his mother was living there. Well, his mother's transitioning out. And he's like, look, 
he wants either top or he actually wanted more than top rice. He's like, dude, this house is nicer than most of the houses in the neighborhood, but I'm just going to rent it. Hmm. And so we're like, okay, well, what, what are you renting it for? Or what are you planning on? Well, I'm thinking about this. Well, if you didn't have to worry about it getting destroyed, if you didn't have to worry about this, if you could get a certain amount of mo money per month, if you didn't have to worry about, you know, and we could guarantee a monthly payment coming in during the rental period, would you rather rent it for a lower amount? Here's what I'm working at. I'm working with homeowners that want to come in and over a period of time, come in and make it their own and purchase it. And then you get to avoid on a $500,000 purchase, you get to avoid nearly $50,000 of commission during this time. Like, do you like that? And he's like, yes. And that's how we got into the conversation. Took three or four times. We'll come to find out we're like the monthly payment. I don't remember. I think it was like 1600 and we're going to rent it for like 2700 I love it. Right? So, so what you have is you have this varying gap based on what they want and what their expectations are. And so that's how you jump into it, right? You just explore. And if they say no, like he went dark on us for a while. If they said no, you just jump back on the phone. Hey, do you not want to do this? Do you not want to make an extra... 250,000 on top of blank, right? Do you know want to, want to make an extra $35,000 in rent, you know, or or 70 grand in rent depending on what the time period is. And you just put that out there and if they don't, you walk away, you go to the next deal. But that's how that's how we walked into that is just highlighting what's in it for them and also being honest like the reason why I'm doing this is I get to make money too. Right? right? Like I make money this way you make money with that. And this is how we can partner. And the difference between a wholesale deal and here is wholesale, there usually needs to be paying to buy it at cash for a right price. Right. Right. So on a, on this, you actually align you and the, the seller's interest together saying you make money and I make money by facilitating what you're trying to accomplish. This is mind blowing stuff because truthfully it, it <laughs> If you are looking at a lot of deals that this would not be something that you would even fathom working if you're just wholesaling or, you know what I mean? Like, how would this work, right? But taking this approach and all you've got to do is kind of ask, hey, is this something that you'd be interested in, right? I mean, think of how many deals, people, that you might be looking at that if, if you just were to ask the question, even if you had a, out of 100 Mark, right? I mean, how many how many potential deals could you have made money? And, and Mark, isn't that the strategy that you use a lot of times? In, like when you're talking to other wholesalers? In every script that I tell my JVs, my wholesalers, my Um, January of last year, negotiated price. We agreed on everything. Um, then COVID hit. And she's like, I don't want to do anything. What happened was it's a five bedroom home. She was with her, her children used to live there. The children moved out. She can't afford it. And she was falling behind on her HOA. And, you know, she was just starting to fall behind. She couldn't, this house was too big for her. So we're going back and forth. She didn't want to do anything in COVID hit. Then we finally came into uh, end of July, August. We finally, she says, okay, I'm ready to go. So I said, this is what I'll do. You know, we agreed to the price. The price at that time, you know, she had it actually, it was on Zillow. She had it for like three, 325. At that time, it was worth about 330. Okay. So I said, okay, this is what I'll do is I will, we'll go ahead and um, we'll do into lease option. I'll go ahead and make sure, you know, we'll make, she didn't care about cash flow. She just wanted her main, her mortgage payment to be made. So I said, okay, what's your mortgage payment? Her mortgage payment was like, I don't know, like $2,100. And um, so everything was good on it. I gave her $10,000 to move, you know, to help her move. And then I had to go in there and get somebody cleaned out. Well, during that time, so, and she only, and part of the negotiating is like, 
she didn't even care about getting any cash. She only wanted ten thousand dollars. Said, "All right, whatever your balance is on that mortgage, when we go to exercise that option, I'm gonna. That's what I'm buying it for." So as I pay it down, so now that property is worth literally two sixty five. Okay, but during the process of when I started the price in January to August. or appraised value or whatever. So that way you don't have to lock in a price. You can lock in that future price if you're assuming it's gonna go up to create like this continual spread. For me, what it also does, I'm so cash flow. I love cash flow, but I, I have a love hate relationship with cash flow. I'm just gonna be honest. I, I, I love and I hate cash flow for a variety of reasons we don't have to get into, but. What I do love is I love big chunks of money at different times. I don't, <laughs> yes. I don't know how else to say it. Everyone tries to downplay it. Oh, you got to find another deal. Dude, when you get a $30,000 check or a $103,000 check, like it's sweet. Like, let's just be honest, right? Super sweet. So in that scenario, you are playing the game of I'm going to do a pay down. I'm going to get cash flow. But at any time, I can stoke the fire under this person and be like, hey, the values are going up. If you want to execute your purchase today, lock in this price, it might go up by 20 grand, right? Or if they hold it, like you can just say, you know what, man, it's it's going up there. They can hold it. Let me let me try and try and get them to hold on for it another two years or whatever to maximize maybe a two year later gain to create a 70, 80, $90,000 spread, dude, that's. Yeah, and the cash flow on that one was about 850 a month. And then also um, it did need a little bit more work. I did some of the work, but it needed some more. And they were willing to take it as is and they went and did the work themselves on that particular one because they Guys, wanted this that is, property. Yeah, this right here, this is how you build wealth. Yes. Just FYI, like this, this right here, like, it's not just about net worth. Like I think a lot of us talk about like, oh, we need to build our net worth, which builds wealth, which is a, which is true. You need to do that. You need to focus on your net worth. But can you realize that net worth in cash? And what's your net worth ratio compared to how much you have cash? And what are your exit strategies in properties, in your investments? How are you rolling them? What is the next step? And that's what we're talking about is we're getting in, we get cash up front through the period. $800 a month is a lot of money per year. That's an extra 10 grand a year almost, right? Then you have an exit strategy. Look, at any time I can cash in on $70,000 that I have sitting there. What that does is it, for me, I've done this. I did this in 2015. I ran into a money. I almost ran out of money, but I had a, I had a property. I could reach into my portfolio, stoke the fire, sell the note because there was equity, and now instead of running out of money, boom, you sell the note and there's a $52,000 insurgence of cash that you have access to rather than it being locked into net worth. It's net worth that you can you can draw on, right? You can pull from and use at any time because you don't know what the future is going to hold. You don't know if you're going to get in a tight spot or if money's going to be there. And so, man, talk. that's how you build wealth right there. That's freaking awesome. So good. So good because you again, it's just another question to ask. You know, hey, would you take this cash offer? Okay, maybe not, but what about would you do this? Right. And it could be yeah. life changing money. And I'm talking career life changing money by just asking that question. So it's something to definitely add to your vocabulary and your script. So I love that, Mark. Beautiful. So Jonathan has a question here um, about state regulations with lease options. Yeah, Texas is a very difficult state to do lease options. Um, however, there is somebody down there, Leon Johnson, he's a lease, uh, lease option expert. Um, I'm actually going to get with him and try to find out how he's doing it. He's done hundreds of them down there. And um, and I don't know the answer to that one in Texas. I don't do lease options in Texas. From what I understand, if you uh, 
the max on a, a lease option can be six months down there, but there's got to be, um, he probably found a strategy, a way through that. So I'll find that out, Jonathan, and then I'll get, and I'll, I'll respond back to you on that particular one. But one thing I do want to say on lease options, another side of it is, and you know, if I'm doing a subject to or owner financing and a seller um, wants to do like a balloon, like they want to be paid off like five years or less, and you're paying pretty much close to that top dollar. And I, when I look at my deals and when I underwrite my deals, I always look at 2008. And one of the things I always do is like, okay, if this market shifts and I got to sit on this for a while, how long is it going to take it to go back? So one of the things and do, even though I can do owner financing lease option, I'm like, okay, since you want a balloon on it and you won't extend it, I'll do a lease option instead because a lease option gives you the option that you do not have to exercise and you can walk away from that deal if you go underwater. So that's the other side of it. Bro, that's so it's refre- powerful. It's re- yes. And it's, and it's, uh, it's proof of recession, right? So it's recession proof a little bit too. If you, if you set it up correctly, that that's beautiful. Well, we're, we're about halfway through guys. So I wanted to now switch over a little bit and put Ronnie more on the hot seat. Cause I know Mark, uh, I know you got a couple of questions for Ronnie as well, but uh, you know, just kind of starting off Ronnie, how, how did you kind of get into, you know, what's your experience with creative finance and how'd you get into it? You know, what, what have you done? I mean, yeah. uh, go, if you could go ahead and please tell us that. Yeah. So I found myself in 2014 um, with this passion to jump into real estate investing, right? I learned about wholesaling. I learned I was selling uh, investments at the time. I was a private client banker at Chase and I was in sales, right? I'm, I'm selling, I'm working, I'm working at the bank. I'm dealing with a high-end clientele but I'm making average money, right? I'm making a good salary. I'm making commission. And I find myself at the spot where I want to jump into real estate investing because I see, you know what, not only can I control my time and my life, I can have freedom, but I can make significantly more money in real estate than I can currently at this job. Like my cap here, 120 to $150,000 a year in real estate, I can become a millionaire. Okay. So I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm literally running around twice a week, putting bandit signs at intersections down major highways, right? Like imagine Ronnie in a Mitsubishi Eclipse, 1998 GST turbo that with a freaking blow off valve buzzing (laughs) manual racing through town with a whole stack of bandit signs on my chair, jumping out, pulling off, running around, putting bandit signs, Like I did that twice a week for a long time. So my question is how you fit in the car, bro. I freaking love (laughs) sports cars, but we're not going to give them that. So, so I'm jumping around. Right. And when you're doing bandit signs, while you're doing it, most of the calls are not from sellers. Most of the calls are from contractors or from other investors or from, you know, looking to connect or whatever. Right. So, and a lot of times it's tire kickers, right? And you don't get a lot. You usually get three or four. If you're doing bandit signs, a, a quick trick is do it right before uh, evening rush hour and you can hit evening and morning rush hour. Um, I don't necessarily recommend bandit signs, but that's what I did um, before they get pulled by court, code enforcement. Yep. So I'm out running around freaking like chicken with my head cut off and I get a call. Actually, I don't get the call. A call comes in my partner at the time answers the phone and this guy says, Hey, look, I'm reaching out to other investors. People who are doing wholesaling uh, at this point. I've done about seven or eight, nine deals, wholesale deals. And he says, um, yo, I can help you take the leads that wouldn't take, um, that you couldn't do cash offers on. I can help you close them by offering them full price and you can get a fee. Hmm. Um, very common. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, Less right. My partner calls me and he's like, Hey, this guy's not. I was like, Hey, why don't you go? I couldn't go because I was working full time. So he went, he met with this guy and came back. He's like, dude, he's doing a seminar, or he's not doing a seminar. He's getting a few people together and he's gonna talk about it. And we can just kind of uh, and see if see if it works. So I was like, all right. So we went on a Wednesday night. Uh, we went and sat down, and I sat down with Grant Kemp back when he got started. Okay, Grant was the one that called my band to sign. And I found myself in this law office with Scott Horn and Grant. And they're basically, what it was, is basically walking through a financial calculator on how and basically telling us, yo, you can buy deals at full price. 
I'm sitting there playing with the calculator and I hit the button for amortization. And I'm like, that's $300,000 for one deal. But, but I'm not even listening to what this dude is saying. I'm just playing on the calculator. Dude, that's it. I was like, all right, dude, I'm in. Over the next month, I brought eight deals. I went through all my previous leads, came to the table, brought eight deals, closed eight more. I think it was, yeah, I think it was eight. <laughs> eight more transactions we closed that one month. And from that point, I was hooked. I was like, yo, getting deals. I got cash flow, blah, blah, blah coming in. And then within two months from that period, uh, I actually jumped into a partnership with them. And over the next year and a half, bought almost 120 homes using primarily creative financing using sub two wraps. Um, from that point, after that portfolio was built, um, I decided, you know what? Um, because of some of my, this is where I have a love hate relationship with cash flow. Because of some of my things that I didn't like with that model, I sold that that portfolio. I sold my interest in it. And I went into basically wholesaling and utilizing creative financing as a purchase strategy, but not necessarily a long-term strategy. And that's where there's utility, right? Where you want to hold stuff as rentals. You can buy it and hold it as a rental. You want to do a wrap and create a note. You can do that. You want to jump into buy something that you're going to fix and flip without a lot of cash. You can do that too, utilizing the strategy of purchasing. And so what I found is, hey, I when I think of being a millionaire, and this is kind of sideways, right? A lot of people will talk about net worth. They'll talk about cash flow. They'll talk about all these things. But when I think about it, it's like I've all oh, in my whole life, a millionaire is someone who has cash, right? Who has millions in cash. And so as I was beginning to think about this, I was like, you know what? I need to adjust my strategy to put myself in a position where I have the power. And so let's adjust and use that cash in order for find ways so I can double it and I can double my business, right? So now what I did is I took the strategy, I took the learning and I married them together and said, okay, how can I create a business that replicates money quickly to jump up to what does a million, two million, three million dollar business look like? And that's where the switch happened, where it wasn't just I'm an investor in creative financing. I'm an investor who uses creative financing to grow my business, to accomplish the lifestyle I want. And that switch happened for me in about mid-2015, where I was like, you know what? Real estate investing is a great investment, but I want to use that to catapult my business. And that's a whole nother conversation. But that's my story. That's kind of been my journey through this. And then I went back to creative financing again in 2019. And I just sold, uh, I actually literally just closed on my second portfolio. I sold that portfolio off again. So I've had, me and creative financing have a love-hate relationship. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I love this so much because I have two absolute studs. I have Ronnie and Mark who, you know, you have some of the history with Mark where he can talk about some of the stuff that's he's seen multiple cycles. Uh, and then you also, you hear from Ronnie about guys who are, are really thinking like, I mean, we're talking doctorates in investing in business when, when you're talking to a Ronnie Walker. So it's, it's awesome. This is, this has been, uh, as, uh, as my, my favorite Ed Milet says, I got goosebumps guys. I got goosebumps. <laughs> well, the question is what if, right? So you're walking through this stuff. It's like, what if I, could have freedom. What if I don't have to only make $75,000 grinding away 12 hours a week at this job? What if I could learn just one thing that changes my life, right? Dude, when you're in the midst of stress, whether you have the bit, let's say you're two, three years in, I've been here and you're like, dude, I have been freaking grinding this out so much. I've been learning creative finance. I've been learning wholesaling and the, I've had money I've had millions of dollars go through my hands and I don't have much to hold up. Like, but that guy before he wanted to be here. What if I can overcome this challenge? What if I could figure out and unlock what Mark is talking about, the actual strategy to create that financial freedom where you, I can travel to Portugal. I can travel to Dubai. I can travel to Ireland. I can travel to the UK. I can, I can do what I want, right? Like, 
it's all about asking yourself, what if I'm the one? You know, what if I could be in the 1%? Like, what if I put in the work? And God, like, that just gives me goosebumps because that was me, right? I'm making 100 grand a year at Chase. And I'm like, what if I could live the life that I dream about? What if I could, you know, develop homes in Ireland? What if I could blank? Then all of a sudden those dreams start kicking in and you're like, am I willing to pay the price to do that? And that's what this group is about. Like with you guys watching, we are here literally in, in front of you. So you don't have to make those same mistakes. When you're on your way to making financial freedom, it's like a jungle with no roadmaps. There are tigers, there are beasts, there are enemies, there are other hunters that will kill you that are trying to do it. There is so much going on. And getting across that jungle for the first time, guys, it is so difficult. Why do you think the graveyard of real estate investors is so many? It's so difficult, right? It's the simplest, hardest thing you'll do. But here at Real Estate Power Play, we want to give you the tools and the tips to be able to say, hey, this is the path, right? Literally, this is the path. Do this. And as you're doing that, you will be able to get that success and you'll be able to add it to your tool belt. And so that's why we're here. So guys, as you're asking questions, we want to ask that through different shows and different things. So anyway, I, I want to, I just want to piggyback off of that about the creative financing. Once you start understanding different strategies, your mind, you can let your mind and explore and you can come up with your own strategies. Like I do a lot of like, I do a sub two and then I'll sell no lease options or vice versa. And like, you can just start looking at, oh, I could do this. What about if I try that strategy and add this to it to kind of help out? So you can kind of, and that's the beauty of you just being creative and coming up with different ways. Just make sure that you talk to your local attorney and make sure that you're within compliance. But yes, just as long as you're staying in compliance and following, you can come up with great ideas and different strategies. And it really is. And like, you don't need a lot of money to get into some of these strategies, like wholesaling, lease options. You know, even owner financing, I just like, I, you know, we took down that 11 doors and I put zero down and it, the seller ended up paying me. <laughs> well, and you that's know? another thing that that I think a lot of us don't have. And, and Marty, I'd love to hear what you think, because it reminds me when when I'm thinking about this, it, it reminds me real estate is really us being opportunity seekers. And Marty is seeking large opportunities. Right. And from those opportunities comes commercial deals comes storage units, comes mobile home parks. So Marty, when you're going after this, when you think of opportunities and jumping in and adding things to your tool belt, how are you taking and learning and applying it to your business? And how do you think about jumping to that next step? And like, how did you go from, man, I'm going to flip houses to, yo, I'm buying two mobile home parks this year. Right. <laughs> right. Cause that's what you're doing. Like, right. like, yo. And then it's like, dude, what if, what if, what if we did, what if we did that? Yeah. You, you know, know what guys, and this is so good because first off, when Ronnie was just talking about, you know, the, what he's talking about is his mindset. It's just, it's years of personal development. This is not something you just change overnight. It's, it's little things that are, you're constantly working on to try to get better every day, even if it's just 1% better. Right. But if we're 1% better every day, we're going to be 360% better every year. Right. So they're there. And for me, Ronnie, when you ask that question, you know, how do you go from, well, how do you go from working a nine to five to then becoming full time? Right. Well, it's a mindset shift that has to occur. And, and it's so funny when you said, how much would your self two years ago want to be where you are now? Right. But now you, now you're like, this sucks. Where I am now is again, it's, it's all, uh, objective, but I, this side, you know, Matt and I, my partner, are like, listen, we we're flipping houses, we're doing great, but dude, we can do more, right? Because it's a mindset thing. Because when you see the people that are doing more, you go, this person's not better than me. It's so so how, right? So and, and then who, right? So it's it, it's also that it's who's also doing this, and who can we talk to, and then how do we how do we elevate? And I for me, that. it was just confidence. And it, it starts with just, you know, those daily routines that help you so that you can make those bigger risks. Because 100%, I believe this, that the more confidence you have in yourself, 
the more willing you are to take bigger risks. And I believe that the bigger risks that you take, right, calculated risks, of course, but the more willingness you have to that, that's how you hit life-changing numbers and becoming part of that 1%. You want to be world-class. It's not middle-class. It's not even upper-class. It's world-class. And that's what we strive for every day. So yeah, it really came as a mindset shift to say, guys, do, you know, do we want to, you know, Matt and I at our, at our meetings, do we want to do this forever? No, we don't want to flip houses forever, right? Because that's more of a job. We really want to set ourselves up for the long term. So yeah, it just it was a mindset shift. And then it was, let's just take the same energy, the same ferociousness, the same absolute just killer mindset that we have as, uh, as finding uh, flips. And then let's cold call or let's find, uh, let's find mobile home park guys that want to sell to us and that will like to sell to us, that need to sell to us, right? That's so right. All, all those things were, uh, were, well, were in play there. That, that reminds me of uh, a thing that you see in a lot of a lot of fiction books, a lot of fantasy I, I like to read and, and even life is a lot of us are, we're on this journey from this location that we find ourselves that are stuck in, right? From, from this little village in the middle of nowhere, right? It could be, you know, Rochester, New York, and, you know, one of the suburbs and nobody knows about. It could be, you know, in Alaska and Wasilla. It could be um, from Florida, you know, in the middle of nowhere, around a bunch of people. We're all in these different spots. And we go on this journey of like, you know what, I want to go to the top of that freaking mountain, right? And so we we exert all this energy and we we go and we we climb this mountain, right? And it's so difficult. And then once we get to the top of the mountain, we have this amazing view and we look around and we're like, dude, I just, I just flipped, I just flipped 55 houses this year. Or I just, in the last two years, I did 30 deals and I made myself a quarter million dollars and I got to do this vacation. I get, and now you're at the top of the mountain. You're like, is this it? But then what you do is you look around and you see, yo, that's a valley. Yo, that's a valley. And you just climbed out of a valley. But what a lot of people don't realize is the valleys, like where the work is, where you're flipping the houses, that's where all the life happens, right? That's where the streams are. That's where the grass is. That's where the flowers are. The top of the, the, top of the mountain is, is this, uh, a friend of mine said, it's a bald, empty rock is what he said. But what you get when you get to the top of that mountain, when you've accomplished that first major hurdle, you get to look around and say, okay, I've made it here. Where do I want to live now? And now you have options, right? Do I want to live in that valley? Do I want to live by that beach? Do I want to live? And what I mean by live is not in a specific location, but what do you want your life to look like, right? What do you want the days to look like? Do you want it to be traveling and doing deals this way? Am I willing to pay that price? Am I willing to, to do that on a day-to-day -day basis? In each area that you look at and the direction you want to go, that all seems possible because dude, look at this hill I just had and all the resources I gained here. I can use those resources now to carve out a domain and a kingdom for myself and I can create an empire around it and you get to choose how you do that. That's the wonderful part about going through this first jungle on your way of growing up. And, and, and I wanna tie this back to lease options. Lease options is a great way of getting to the top or even living in and creating wealth. I mean, look at what Mark's done. If you guys are following him, Gosh, he's he's created a lifestyle for himself and it's based on what he wants, right? It's not based on what other people want. It's based on what he wants. I've created a lifestyle based on what I want. I'm pursuing a lifestyle and I think Marty is in the same way. We are pursuing being world-class and you can do that and you do that by just internalizing it and saying, okay, let me learn these strategies. Let me figure out what lease options look like and let me decide what direction we want to go Guys, I mean, that's that's powerful. So you pick the one thing, you go to the top, and then you choose where you want to go, and you live there. And once you're there, and this is why I love this show. Again, I'm, I'm harping on the show and just learning from you guys and being in this environment, especially Mark, is once you're there, you have these resources. And guys, we want to share that, right? Like lease option, go back and listen to what Mark said. There were so many nuggets. I mean, controlling. If the market goes down, Lots of different things. So, so uh, Marty, I want to give it back to you. You're the host here. I'm I'm used to doing it, but uh, go back. I've I got myself fired up. I don't want to I don't want to take the the spotlight. 
I love when Ronnie's fired up. And I want to, I also want to just kind of say something about Mark too, because you know, Mark also, when he was talking about it, he, he, he had a business with, you know, 50, 70, hundred employees. Right. So he lived that life. Right. And he now knows because he's uh, he, you know, even though he may say he's older, he looks just like us. He looks as young as us. Um, he's living a life. He, he created a lifestyle business that anybody can do and still make over, over six figures. Right. Which is, which is really super beautiful. Um, I, I, I love that. I love that you can create a giant mega business. Like the ones I know, I know Ronnie, whatever he wants to do, he'll do. I know what I want to do. I'm going to do, but Mark's already been down that path and, and he's, and he's done that. Um, I did want to ask both of you a question. I guess we'll start with Ronnie here. Um, could you give me your best deal uh, maybe this year that you've done through creative financing? Um, it, it, just go ahead and give us like one of your best deals that you remember. Maybe it doesn't yeah. have to be your most profitable. It just could be like a favorite deal that you did. Yeah. So uh, my favorite deal ever uh, was actually not this year. Uh, it was back in 2017. Uh, so I bought a house and the house was in Frisco. It looked like a castle. It had a circular build. Okay. Um, we bought it literally. We closed on it the Friday before the Tuesday of foreclosure. Um, and guys talk about like back and forth with a seller, like not being for it. And, and we're talking about like a, a $500,000 purchase here. Right. So it was a big purchase. I was bringing 70 grand to the table, slightly nervous about it. Um, but it could either be worth, I don't remember the exact, it could, I could either make a hundred thousand dollar profit or I could make 20, right? Like that was like the, the spread, like it was in that little bit. And, um, we bought the deal. I remodeled it, dude. Yeah. I took my whole family out to the house, right? Like it was a sweet house. It was like 5,500 square feet. We went and played through the house the day where I had people come through. Um, we played out in the backyard, beautiful backyard with an amazing view. And uh, I remember walking in and being like, you know what? I'm going to have a house someday like this, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm going to have, because at that time we were, we were living in a, a 1700 square foot house in, in uh, Forney, uh, Texas. I was like, I'm going to have a house like this. I'm going to have a big house. Kids can run. We can have as much time as we want. Like this is what it's about. Well, come to turn out, we finished the day. I finished up the remodeling. I literally made three payments on the house and turned around, put it on the market. It immediately sold. The net profit after all of it was uh, was over a hundred thousand. Love it. And um, and at that time, I really needed the money too. So it was like, you know what? Not only did that deal, and I think that's what happens at some point, at least for me, is. I'm doing the deal and it's like, yo, I'm going through the business. And then I come across something really exciting. And it's like, you know what? I'm making money on this deal, but I want to live in this. Mm. Mm. Right. And so that's, man, as far mm. as a favorite, I would say that not only did I make the literally, that was the most money I've ever made on a property, but it also created this. I mean, that's why I'm in a, I'm in a 4,000 square foot house right now with literally 400 acres around me right? Like there's a national preserve over here and a, right. Like that sparked even more of the dream. And that was, that was four years into my journey. So that would be my, that'd be my old time favorite deal. I love it because it, it gave you a vision too, right? That's right. So, so not only did you take the risk to do it, it worked out, which, yep. which when, when you're the luckiest guy in the world and when God has your back, right, that happens. And mm -hmm. I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And I know Ronnie does, and I know Mark does. So those things happen. So, so Mark, what was your, what was your best deal? I'll ask you the same question afterwards. Um, but for me, I don't. I, I look at deals just as a transaction nowadays. I don't like fall in love with deals anymore. I kind of what I enjoy mainly is really helping the seller or buyer. It makes me, you know, I I enjoy that more than anything. Like somebody like you know, just thanking you so much for helping them out of a situation that they're in and they don't know how to get out of. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I have a, I just helped somebody not too long ago. She was a seller on a, in a situation and I didn't, 
I didn't do the deal, but I gave her some really good advice to help her out. It was a really bad situation. I don't want to get into it all, but she was stuck and and she didn't know what to do. And she even talked to some attorneys and the attorneys were just kind of giving her a runaround. They wanted all this money, blah, blah, blah. And I just gave her some advice, you know, hey, do this, this and this. And, and it, it solved the problem. She called me up and like literally crying and thanking me. And I, I enjoy that in the business more than anything. You know, so deals, I don't, I have many deals, but I don't look at them like, wow, I love certain ones anymore. Um, that's just where I'm at. How about you, Marty? You got to love when a guy's done so many deals, he doesn't even remember his favorite deals there. You know what I mean? Like that's Mark Monroe for you. But uh, I, I guess my favorite deal would have been, I'll just say this year because it, it, it's one of those things where it's just like it giving you the confidence to ask the questions because sometimes when you, like I said, when you ask the questions, sometimes people say yes. So I asked the individual, Hey, would you, you know, take the equity in installments, right? When one of my questions I like to ask and uh, you know, he said, well, sure. And I, and I you know, talked about how, how about you just hold it? You know, do you need the money? No. Well, could you give it to your kids later on? Yeah, I could. Would you hold it for 30 years? Yeah. Okay, great. And, you know, would you mind if I just, you know, nothing down and we, I could just pay you monthly going forward? Sure. And, how, you know, so I, really what it was was just just ask because you never know. You never know what they're going to say. And, and that's the beauty of this business is that so many different sellers are in different situations. They don't always need the cash that day is kind of what we learned. And sometimes they are looking at long term, but it's about it's about just making sure that you're asking the questions and. You never know what they're going to say and then ask the question, then shut up. <laughs> so don't, don't try to, don't try to get them out of that idea of, uh, of selling you a house with no money down and holding paper for, for, for 30 plus years. So anyway, guys, that, that's kind of uh, my favorite. And then we're, we're kind of getting to the end of the show here. I guess we could go around um, for the next couple minutes and, and talk about uh, maybe next week or what would you like, what would you guys like to end the show with here? Well, Marty, you know, you hit the nail on the head on that statement. It's about just asking. There's so many of those deals out there. 40% of homes have no mortgage. There's so much of it out there. But I'm going to, um, for myself, um, you know, one thing I want to put out there, you guys, the viewers, do us a favor. Give us some feedback. What do you want? Do you like us just talking about our stories or do you want us to go into more of the meats and potatoes? You know, give us feedback what you guys want from us. I um, would really appreciate it. I know a lot of you guys are watching this later on because we're live during the daytime, but leave us comments, likes, thank yous, whatever, and just let us know what we can do to kind of help you guys out. Yeah, and I would say, remember, we're here 12, 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time every Tuesday uh, at the moment. Also, as you're going through, tag your nuggets and what and what that looks like. So otherwise, Mark, man, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing your thought. Marty, uh, for being the moderator today. Guys, let's uh, let's go and uh, do a power play this week, guys. This has been another episode of Real Estate Power Play, guiding real estate entrepreneurs to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or follow us on YouTube at Real Estate Power Play.